So here's another sketchbook tour. I started this sketchbook in 2016. It's one of those very large, you can see how big it is, Moleskina sketchbooks that I favor. And this one has a smooth paper. It's a bit like Stonehenge printmaking paper. So this is the one I like to draw in with a pen. I tape things in here. Obviously, I was thinking about <laughs> the state of the world, sinking ship. Right around this time, I started the newsletter project. Uh, I had left Facebook because of its complicity in uh, disinformation and it, how it impacted our election, Cambridge Analytica. I feel like all that stuff I was reading back then has become very mainstream conversation now. So what I did was I made a series of takes and then I just physically mailed them out to a bunch of people that I knew. Although privately I called it the newsletter from the end of the world. It's also looking at the Dada artists at the time. I say unto you, there is no beginning and we do not tremble. Lots of stuff in here. I have this really big marker that I like and maybe that's why I like the big sketchbook. I don't know. Mm. This was during a hurricane. So one thing I like to do sometimes is either watch a movie or a newscast or a documentary. And then I just keep my sketchbook open and I draw kind of instant responses to what I'm seeing or hearing. I write down a lot of things that are said because there's little bits and pieces of that stuff that might influence the work later. I remember the newscasters always come up with these little terms like the path of wrath, which I thought was kind of strange. Uh, I made a list of the things people were buying from the Home Depots, bottled water, six packs, plywood, sheet metal, and cans. Uh, if you remember, pretty sure Trump wanted to drop a bomb inside the hurricane. Sign of what was to come. This, I just listened to an hour to all the various newscasters and whether people reporting on what was happening and I wrote down as much as I could in the shape of the hurricane. And of course, like this doesn't look like my work. You know, it doesn't look anything like my work. None of this does. But the point is that a sketchbook is a place where you cultivate ideas. It's not necessarily an aesthetic um, corollary to what you're doing in the studio. This is a mock-up for a catalog cover. Drawing of destruction. Oh, this is a study for a painting I actually made. Oh, one of the hurricane weathermen said, I just got a leaf or a little piece of something in my eye. I don't know, sometimes little poignant snippets come through. These are the Kuwaiti oil fields burning. Obviously, I was really thinking about those. This is actually a photograph taken from a photograph from 1991, which was oh, the year after I graduated from high school. Oh, <laughs> so soft, so small. These are Trump's angry little marshmallow hands because sometimes you just have to make a collage. And some more balloon studies, more balloon studies, lists of words. I really like words. I write down lots of words in how they kind of relate to each other, like distraction, distortion, noise, variance, etc. Little thumbnail sketches. Oh, confetti. I think I was sick when I did this. I, I was coming down with something and I just started drawing the confetti. I think this is when I really was starting to think about how I might use confetti in my work. So there's a variety of approaches to it in the sketchbook. There's a gouache interpretation, drawing it. I started playing with the balloons here. Oh, what was I reading about here? I was reading about bots. Know your bots, amplification bots, amplified content. Drawing is thinking. Some more balloons, some more confetti. Oh, this I did with the Kramer, actually this set of Kramer fluorescent 
watercolors, which are just beautiful. They have this crazy high pigment load. And I used a super crisp flat brush to get this effect. I thought this worked pretty well. Some color tests. Here's a quote from Reverend Dr. William Barber II runs a poor people's campaign. He said, people only cheat you when they can't beat you in a fair fight. When they can't beat you in a fair fight. We are stronger than we realize. Whew. Very relevant still. More confetti. Oh, and then I figured it out and I made a stencil. So I started hand cutting stencils to make the confetti. And this is actually the final form it took in the work. These are a bunch of notes, I think, on mountaintop removal in West Virginia. Oh, I got really obsessed with Dorothy's house in The Wizard of Oz, and I was looking at the film and just freezing it and freezing it over and over again, looking at this model. And I was fascinated with how the, when the house blows apart, how all the bits of it look like confetti, wreckage and debris. This is still the West Virginia project. You know, I, I had this idea, I'm gonna go to West Virginia, ask my cousin to take me to a mountaintop removal site, and I wanna paint these ghost mountains, like mountains that are gone. And I thought there was really something there. And of course, when I got there, the, the way, it, you, when you hear mountaintop removal, you think there's some like horrible chasm that's opened up where the mountain used to be, but really they level it all out and it ends up looking kind of like a green valley and I think they're looking to develop up in those spaces. So it, it, those valleys look out of place, but they don't look like the destruction that they are. You have to go to an open mining site in order to see that. And those are really, really hard to get into. They, they're pretty secured. Um, so that's a good example of sometimes you have an idea, you pursue the idea, you travel to the other side of the country to investigate the idea. And then it turns out that aesthetically or visually, it's just not going to work. Uh, and as an artist, you know, you have to do that stuff. You can't just do what you know is going to work or else you'll just keep making the same work over and over and over again. I think this is, I was reading a book on the atmosphere. So you can see I got the stratosphere, mesosphere, ionosphere. I'm really obsessed with like when we run out of air as we hit space. These are, oh, this is from when I was taking all the family Super 8 film and digitizing it. I mean, look at this image. These are my cousins. Thumbnails. I'm a big fan of that. I clearly cut something out of this page. I must have used it for something. Um, I love thumbnails. Your teachers make you do it. I know students don't like to do them. I ask students to do them. And, you know, it's, it's always met with a kind of look of despair, but they're actually pretty useful. So I work with a lot of squares and I, I like to do these thumbnails so I can think about juxtapositions and how a story unfolds using various images side by side. And this is a list of paintings. This, I'm still endlessly fascinated with balloon drops and political conventions. And I guess, you know, given the state of affairs right now in the United States, like I might revisit some of these images. Cause the thing that I always thought was interesting is that the balloon drops look the same, no matter which convention you're at, you know, it's this kind of bizarre bit of political theater that in a way we, we expect and take for granted, but it has a really interesting history. I was reading about how this kind of spectacle started to emerge, you know, and a lot of my work is about the landscape as a site for spectacle. You know, these apocalyptic landscapes are spectacle and there's a long history of that in painting. And so political spectacle really has started entering into my work as well. There's some more, less tidy thumbnails. Some printouts. Ah, there's a painting in here. This is a little gouache painting of my cousins all running down the street. This is from a, a capture from the eight millimeter film. You can't go home again. These are little sketches from the eight millimeter film. 
while it was digitizing, I would just sit there and draw. You know, I write notes to myself all the time. You don't ever see it until you paint it. It's very true. When you have to paint something, you look at it completely differently. Changes the way you see it. Oh, I know what this is. This is, I was supposed to go storm chasing, like with an actual storm chasing outfit, which is something I wanted to do for a very long time. And uh, the pandemic struck and I was unable to go. I still haven't gone. But the tour that I picked uh, centered on the middle of America. And they have these little maps that show you the intensity of the tornadic activity on any given set of dates as, you know, tornado alley moves this way up across the U.S. So I thought this looked kind of like a heart or a wound right in the middle of the nation. And I felt that that would be a really interesting metaphor for me to play with um, in that work. And I really hope I get to do that still. I just cannot envision sitting in a van for hours at a time with a bunch of strangers in the middle of America. It just seems wildly dangerous because apparently the guy that, that runs these tours is still running them, but I, I don't know. I might have to forfeit the deposit I put down there. Uh, here's another little painting. This is myself hanging from a monkey bars in Ohio when I was a kiddo, but the film's all melted. So I was kind of interested in all the bits of film that got chewed up or somehow destroyed. And uh, another list of words, storm, perfect storm, storm, the capital. Oh, wow. So that happened. That's a thing that happened. Stormy weather. So the storm, you know, it's a metaphor, right? Like I just talked about that here and language, the way we use certain words, I'm interested in as well. And storm is one of those words as a storm, right? But we use it in a military context. And white suprematists use it too, the daily stormer, storm troopers from the Nazis. So this word, when you start to unpack it, has a lot of different ways it can be looked at. And so the whole storm thing that I'm working on in my work, it, it all relates to that. And I wrote a little thing here. What did I write? Cyclical moving parts are in a practice. Cyclical moving parts in a practice are forever in play. Markets want con constancy, a product that is knowable, but the viability for this long term is impossible. There are moments where everything lines up to make a cohesive, focused body of work, something knowable, marketable. But most of the time, there are many projects vying for an audience. Wow, that is some deep thoughts fields, but you know what? Pretty true. I'd say I still believe that. There's more storm studies nocturnes. So right around this time, we had gone to Dallas to visit a sick family member and a big tornadic storm um, swept right across where we were staying, where my husband's parents live. And so I photographed it and started a body of work um, using them. And I have quite a few of those paintings sitting around the studio now. And <laughs> sometimes I yell things in my sketchbook when I learned that the sun would die, which I do remember. I think this was ninth grade science and we were learning about the universe and celestial bodies the sun no supernovas white dwarfs you know how suns die and I guess it had never occurred to me that our sun would die and even though I knew that this was so far in the future that I would no longer be alive when it happened it it made me really sad and I remember I cried and the teacher just couldn't figure out why I was crying, but I just didn't want our son to die because it's our son. And, you know, I feel exactly the same way about the planet we live on. You know, so much of my work is about climate change and uh, the destruction of the planet, the willful destruction through our actions as a species. So, you know, sometimes the ideas in your work, they come from who you are and who you've always been. Like my attachment to this place, this planet, it's always been there, you know, because the thing that really shook me when I learned this was not just that our sun would die, but that it would engulf the earth and the earth would die too. Obviously, I was getting ready to do something that I never did. Oh, this is when the pandemic hit. Mm. You see, I was making schedules for myself. 
trying to figure out how to live my life online, teaching from home. That schedule really hasn't changed. A profitable state of anxiety. I was already thinking about how certain people would profit off the pandemic. Bread and circuses, mid-apocalypse crisis, <laughs> kind of like a midlife crisis. <laughs> Sometimes I write down funny things. Oh, and that looks like the end. So I have some more pages here. I think when the pandemic hit, I really switched to a different sketchbook, uh, something that is more for text because I started writing things down more than I was drawing. So maybe I will keep this out and pick up where I left off in this beautiful sketchbook because it's still got about 10 pages left. So that is sketchbook tour number two. And, you know, to conclude this little bit, I'm making this video because for my students, I want you to see and understand how a sketchbook can enhance your practice, can help you discover your ideas, can help you capture fleeting thoughts that may or may not enter into your work. You know, not you're not going to use everything. And it's nice to have a place that isn't a commodified space that is just yours. So the sketchbook really does occupy that space for me. So I hope this has been helpful, useful, interesting, and I have some more sketchbooks and maybe I will show you another one another time.